I'm Britton Trice with Garden District Bookshop. I'd like to welcome everybody today and especially welcome our two authors, um, Aria Lahorn and Deanna Rayburn. Uh, we're here to celebrate their release, recent release of their two new books, uh, both in paperback. Uh, Ariel's, Ariel's new book, uh, codename Helen, and Deanna's book, the fourth in the series, The Murderous, Murderous Relation. Uh, we're excited to have these here and to have, have them here to talk to us about their book and their work and to answer questions. Um, if people have questions, there's a chat button at the bottom the, of the menu. And um, if people have any questions, please type those questions into the chat bar and we will get to those questions either during, the, during our talk or at the end. Um, and got a few more people in the waiting room. Great. So anyway, I will, let's see, I need to close this. Anyway, introduce uh, Ariel first. And Ariel, Ariel is a critically acclaimed author, the New York Times bestselling historical fiction. She's the author of The Wife, The Maid, and The Mistress, The Flight of Dreams, I Was Anastasia, and of course the newest, codename Helene. A wonderful historical novel set in Paris during World War II. Um, really, a, and it's based on a true story. So can't wait to hear a little bit more about that. And then we have Deanna. And Deanna. Deanna Rayburn is the New York Times and USA Today bestselling novelist, uh, a sixth generation Texan, although now living in Virginia with her, her uh, husband and child. She graduated with a double major in English and history from the University of Texas in San Antonio and she married her college sweetheart and is the mother of one. And they now are still in Virginia. And her novels have been nominated for numerous awards, including the Edgar, two RT Reviewers Choice Awards, the Agatha, two Dillis Wins, and A Last Laugh. She launched a new Victorian mystery series in the 2005 release with A Curious Beginning, and followed that up with her second Victoria Veronica Speedwell uh, novel of a perilous undertaking. And then book three, A Treacherous Curse was published in 2018 and nominated for the Edgar Award. And then a, The Dangerous Collaboration was released in 2019. And then the latest Veronica novel, A Murderous Relation uh, is, is in, was in stores in 2020. So congratulations to both of our authors uh, for their body of work. We can't wait to hear more about it. So I'm gonna turn the floor over to Deanna and, and um, Ariel, and let them take it away. So oh, well, welcome thank again you, to the Garden District Bookshop. Thanks for having us, Britton. Yes, thank you so much. This is really fun. And sorry we couldn't be there in person, but one day we will maybe even come back together and get to do this then. Yes. But until then, thank you for Let's having us. Let's do that. It'll be fun. <laughs> I, you notice no one has ever actually let us do an event in the same place at the same time physically. I, I, I think they know. I think they know. This is not a good idea. Well, there, there was the one. There was yours at Parnassus that we did. I got to interview you. That's true. That's yeah. absolutely true. But we didn't get to talk about your stuff as much. Well, I that was technically out. my event. So we need, to, we need to get something together with both of us. Uh, yeah, where we're in person that. getting up to hijinks. Yeah, that would be a blast. And my light just went out. Sorry. I got, oh, well, I'm dim. Um, <laughs> in more ways than one today. That's how I feel. But I think we met Deanna. I want to say it was close to 2015 when A Curious Beginning came out. And I think if I'm remembering correctly, we were in Raleigh. That's about how long we've known. We were. Each. We were. It was at uh, SIBA. Yes, which is yeah. uh, the organization for Southern booksellers and it was uh, independent booksellers and it was a very good time and someone I can't remember who said this is the magnificent Ariel Lahan you have to meet her and I just said yes. That was Jocelyn Jackson. It was Jocelyn Jackson who is by the way I, like I'm contractually obligated to tell <laughs> a national treasure 
every time yeah. I say her name, it has to be followed with Jocelyn Jackson National Treasure. Um, yeah. It's fine. It's reciprocal. She does the same for me. Um, mm. But we we both agreed that you are also a national treasure, and that's why. Oh, well, thank you. I just have to cross as often as possible. <clears throat> okay, so your paperback that is just out. Here's my copy that Which I, I don't even have my paperback yet. I only have my hardcover. I haven't even gotten mine yet. I have my original <laughs> advanced release copy and I keep it. It is my precious. Oh, it's actually, oh, <laughs> like my original advanced copy. Oh, see, there we go. Um, yeah. This is book five in the series and I have it never is. been shy about the fact that I absolutely love your books. This series in particular, the first book in this series, A Curious Beginning, was actually the first novel of yours that I read. It was an advanced release copy. It hadn't been published yet. And there was no sequel yet because it hadn't even been written yet. <laughs> so what I did to console myself for the two years it took is I went back and I read every single thing you'd ever written. And I, I didn't loved know them. that. Yes, yes, your well, lady. I'm very touched. All of them, I have them all. All of which to say, I love you as a person. I also love you as an author. And I would love it if you would just share with us a little bit about Veronica in general um, and kind of where this book falls in the series overall. Absolutely. Um, although there's no way I can do justice to it after an introduction like that. Um, this is, as Britton said, it's book uh, five in the series, A Murderous Relation. Um, book six will be out March 2nd. I don't even have a copy yet. I can show you the bookmark. That's what the cover looks like. Um, I am having so much fun writing this series. The uh, main character is Veronica Speedwell who is a lepidopterist, which is just a fancy natural history word for butterfly collector. And what I love about Veronica is she's not your typical Victorian heroine. And the way she came about is that, um, also as Britton said, I got my degree in English and history. I double majored. And one of the things that um, they didn't teach a whole lot of when I was getting my degree is what women were up to. We learned a lot about what men were doing. Um, and the shorthand for that is war. Men were doing war all throughout history. Um, but I was really interested in what the women were up to. So after I got my degree, um, and it's been a good 30 years since I graduated from college, I started reading up on Victorian female explorers that just kind of ended up being this pet area that I was intrigued by because we always think of Victorian women as sitting in the parlor, tatting lace and serving tea to the vicar. But when you dig a little deeper, you find that Victorian women were actually doing some incredibly interesting and amazing things. They were packing up and traveling the world. Um, sometimes they did it just as tourists and sometimes they did it under the guise of work, um, maybe archeology, span maybe botany, natural history. And one woman in particular was absolutely fascinating to me. And her name was Margaret Fountain. Um, Margaret was a lepidopterist. She was a butterfly hunter. And it was a really good way for a woman to make a living um, because all it took was about 30, 35 butterflies. And you could earn as much as a lady's maid uh, over the course of a year. And it's not that difficult to catch 30 or 35 butterflies and sell them to collectors. Well, Margaret butterflied around the world six different continents. She did it until she was in her 70s when she dropped dead with her butterfly net in her hand. Um, there's even a little plaque on the side of the road in Santo Domingo where she died saying, this is where Margaret Fountain died. Um, the cool thing about Margaret is like most Victorians, she wrote about what she did. She kept journals mm -hmm. and they were fabulous journals. They were all about her travels. They were all about her butterflies and they were all about all the men she did while she was doing her travels, because it turns out, um, Margaret kind of put it about a little bit. Um, Margaret had um, interracial relationships, Margaret had premarital relationships, and it was um, not as unheard of as you would think for the time. Uh, and she was very frank about these things in her journals. And two of them have been published. They're long since out of print. Um, but as soon as I read them, I thought, dang, if I ever write another Victorian character, I want her to have a few characteristics that are an homage to Margaret. And so as an homage to Margaret, Veronica Speedwell is a lepidopterist. She is a woman who is incredibly intrepid, who travels the world butterflying and um, you know, enjoying herself. 
Um, and she has hooked up with a, a sidekick who is an aristocratic black sheep and they keep falling over dead bodies as you do. Um, and so, uh, you, you know, now I like, I'm writing adventure number seven right now, the series just keeps going and I have the greatest time with it. Um, and it, I have not, I, I cannot envision a time when this is going to get old and I'm going to get tired of, of writing about these characters. But as you guys saw a few minutes ago, I was petting, fondling my copy of Codename Helen because Ariel said some nice things about me. But here's the thing. Ariel is one of those writers. I cannot actually read her when I'm writing because her narrative voice is so specific and so luminous and so glorious. And I am such a huge fan that I start subconsciously trying to imitate her voice when I'm writing. So she is verboten to me uh, when, I'm, when I'm trying to write. I have to save her for a treat. Um, and so, I, and because Ariel, your books are big. They take a yes, lot of work. You, you do not turn and burn when you, <laughs> like it, there's time between your books. So yeah. I get a chance to save them up and, and really savor them. You, girl, you worked your bottom off on Codename Helen because yeah. I actually know a little bit about the genesis for this book. I know who this woman is. And when you told me you were writing about Nancy Wake, I, I don't know if you remember that phone call, but I about dropped the phone. I was so <laughs> excited. Um, and, and you've magnificently done justice to the legend that was Nancy Wake. So for people who don't know Nancy Wake, fill them in. Yes, I will give you the uh, Cliff Notes version. None of this is a spoiler. <clears throat> it's practically back cover copy. Nancy Wake was this young, Australian expat. She left home at 16 years old. She'd gotten this small inheritance from one of her aunts. Left home, went to the United States, lived in New York for a long while, lived in London, finally ended up in Paris where she had bluffed her way into a reporting job for Hearst newspapers. And she's living there, she's beginning a career and she meets this really handsome, very wealthy French industrialist. And no sooner do they get married then the Germans invade France and literal all hell breaks loose. And she was like everyone else, everyone else had to decide, will I sit here and watch this happen or will I do something about it? And Nancy Wake was not the sort of woman who would stand aside and let all hell break loose. So she began working with the French resistance, smuggling people and documents out of the country. And she became so successful at her work that the Gestapo gave her the nickname of the White Mouse because they couldn't catch her. And they put a 5 million franc price on her head. And she became the most wanted person by the Gestapo throughout the war in any theater. And suddenly she was faced with this choice of, do I stay here, continue my work and likely die, or do I escape? She chose the second option. She escaped, leaving her husband behind to hold down the fort, mind you. Went over the mountains into Spain, but she didn't quit. She got on a boat, went to London, joined the special operations executive, and was eventually parachuted back into France behind enemy lines, where she ended up leading 7,000 French resistance soldiers into battle against the Germans right about the time that D-Day happened. A phenomenal woman, an I absolutely phenomenal woman. I couldn't do that much if I lived 10 lifetimes. And she did it <laughs> in about eight years. No, but that's, that's what I think is so funny about both of these books. They're different time periods, they're different personalities, but you and I were both hugely inspired by women who actually lived. I mean, yes. people always ask us where we get our ideas. Oh my God, the ideas are not the hard part. There's so yes. much out there that we yes. can mine for I have, characters. Yeah. I have more ideas than I could write in a lifetime. And I think you've heard me say this before. I will go to my grave saying this. If you want to know what happened during any moment in history, go ask the women who lived through it. And if they're no longer with us, find their diaries, find their letters, find their papers, because they are less concerned with the bombs and the battles and more concerned with the intimacies of life and the betrayals and all of the smaller things, not even smaller things, all of the intimate things 
that make up a human life during a historic moment. Well, and that's why I'm, I'm so glad to see that um, material and social history are becoming so much more important. And they're, they're starting to pay attention to what women were doing. And they're starting to look at little things um, as opposed to just, oh, we're having war now. Let's have some war. Um, and, and they're rediscovering these stories that have, that have uh, not always been celebrated and not always been to the forefront. And um, it's, a, it's a great time to be uh, a historical fiction writer yeah. uh, because there's just so much fantastic material that you can mine. Um, and I mean, any one of these women that we're discovering would make a fantastic book. Yes. Um, so um, we're very lucky. Yours, one of the things I love most about it, you once described it as being set in London and being Jack the Ripper adjacent. So. <laughs> Not necessarily about Jack the Ripper, but adjacent, yeah. set in London during the days of his horrible rampage. So I'm curious, why, why that specific choice for this specific book? Because the last thing I wanted to do was write a Jack the Ripper book. It's the one thing I always said I was never going to do is write a Jack the Ripper book because mm -hmm. anybody who writes a Victoriana at some point you write a Jack the Ripper book. And I was completely opposed to it. But the problem is based on the timeline of my characters, I was coming up on the autumn of 1888. Mm -hmm. And you literally cannot write about London in the autumn of 1888 without dealing with Jack the Ripper because it was the story. Um, it's all anybody talked about. Mm -hmm. As soon as the first uh, of the, what we consider to be the canonical murders started taking place, the city was absolutely gripped by this story. And it was, it was a time of particular unrest um, in Victorian London. Um, a lot of people are shocked to find out that there was actually a tent city of homeless people in Trafalgar Square, like right mm -hmm. in the big middle of London. And there were people camping out. You know, it was, it was very much uh, 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 like what we would see in, in, you know, like under an underpass or something where people have made uh, a temporary home for themselves and kind of gathered together for safety. Um, so there was a lot of unrest because of, of uh, kind of people who we would now say are underprivileged being in the city and more visible in ways than they had been in the past. And as soon as the murder started to happen, people started to fragment and to turn on each other. There was a lot of oh. factionalism. People started to blame the Jewish community. They blamed Catholics. They blamed the poor. Mm -hmm. They blamed the rich uh, because the rich weren't doing enough to take care of the poor. Um, and so what you saw was people turning on each other. There were massively sensationalized news stories every single day. There were editorials in the newspapers talking about you know, who was to blame, who was responsible. Incredible pressure via the media for the establishment, for the police to get it right and to unmask because London had never been in a grip of this kind of a crime wave. There had been sensational murders before, but nothing like this. Um, and if you're at all fascinated with Jack the Ripper um, and that time in London history, this is a phenomenal book. Um, Hallie Rubenhold is an excellent historian and The Five is about, um, the five canonical victims uh, of Jack the Ripper. And they're actually the women to whom I dedicated a murderous relation. Um, and the, the fascinating thing about the five, um, Hallie Rubenholtz's book is the fact that she went in and did a great deal of primary research. And she discusses a lot in the book about how we tend to think these women were prostitutes. We've always heard they're prostitutes. They weren't prostitutes, not in the way we think of prostitution. They were not 24 seven sex workers. That's not what they did. They were women who turned to prostitution when they could not make ends meet any other way. Um, and some, like a couple of them in particular had been born into perfectly respectable circumstances. They, they, they were wives, they were mothers. Um, alcohol played a huge role in how a couple of them ended up where they did. Um, but there was very much a sense of, oh, there but for the grace of God, because you see in these women's lives, there's so little social safety net. All it took was one, two little turns of the, of the wheel, and all of a sudden, you're living on the street. 
you know, they would go when uh, the hops were ripe in Kent, they would go to Kent and they would pick hops. They would make um, little uh, flowers for milliners that they would sell to milliners to put onto hats, but that didn't always cover the price of a bed. And so right. that's when they would turn to prostitution. And seeing how complicated and intricate their lives were, um, to me, again, going back to these are stories that we don't necessarily know. I was so fascinated by the work she did kind of bring the complexities of their lives to the forefront in a way that had not been done before. It's been fascinating too, to see how much pushback and how much rage there has been directed at her for daring to say these women were not who you think they were. Um, and for putting yeah. the focus on the victims instead of on the murderer. And that was something I was absolutely uh, just not gonna be swayed from at all is that this book could not be about the murderer. There was no way I was gonna write a book about him. So mm -hmm. it, it, it touches very, very briefly uh, on what was going on at the time because it was the biggest news story. And there's one particular encounter that, that you, you kind of cross paths with people who were there at the time, uh, but it is in no way, shape or form a, hey, my character solved the mystery of who Jack the Ripper was because I don't care who he was. Right. I was far more interested in who his victims were. Right. Um, and that was that was just a, a really fascinating rabbit hole of research. So when you were digging into Nancy's life, yes, and you were finding out all about Nancy Wake, everything there is to know, and there was a lot to know, mm -hmm. which part of her life did you find the most interesting? Like, what was your entry point to getting oh. into her head? So there's a lot, and a lot of it's in the book, but there's one particular story that to me completely summarized her character. And I'll kind of give a brief overview, but hopefully- Talk as I'll long as you want, girl. <clears throat> I am here so for these stories. She, like I said, she left home at 16. I also left home at 16. So I felt this sense of, oh, we have this similarity. I did not travel nearly as far and wide as she did, but I left home and I traveled quite a bit. And like I said, she went to New York, she went to London. About the time that she'd been in London, oh, a few months, she realized she was quickly running out of funds, that the inheritance that her aunt had left her was not going to last much longer. And she was faced with two choices. She could get a job or she could go back to Australia. And there was no scenario in which she wanted to go back to Australia. So she took a class, I think it was at Queens College in typing and stenography and just the basic secretarial skills and answers an ad in the newspaper for a freelance journalist. And she gets the interview thinking, there's no way this is gonna work. She shows up for the interview and the guy's like, well, you know, you're great, but we're really looking for somebody who is fluent in Egyptian because that's a growing area of interest for our newspaper. <clears throat> and off the top of her head, she's like, well, I'm fluent in Egyptian. I've been there several times. I can read it and I can write it. <laughs> lie complete and total lie and the <laughs> the guy's like okay prove it to me and he pulls his book off the shelf and he reads a passage he's like i want you to transcribe this so he reads i don't know several paragraphs and she's writing down writing down he goes let me see it and she turns it around and to him it looks like hieroglyphs i mean they use arabic but he didn't know that and he goes well read it and so she did and she read it verbatim to him and what she'd done off the cuff is transcribe his entire passage in Pittman shorthand and she convinced him that she could read and write Egyptian and she got the job on the spot and I read that and I thought oh my god I love her like that's brilliant how do you like come up with that off the top of your head but that's who she was she could think on the fly and she was one of those people that always made the right comment, like the right retort. I think of the right thing to say about two and a half days later, but Nancy could always just fire back. <clears throat> and I know this has been the case for you as well. You begin to read and you begin to research and you find yourself with this growing affection for your subject. Oh, it's, not just that, it's not just that you are interested in them or you want to tell their story, but you find yourself 
really beginning to like them. And the more I read, the more I realized it was an absolute shame that people don't know who she is. She really should be a household name. Little girls should dress up as her for Halloween. And even though I'd sworn I would never write a World War II novel, I found myself (laughs) smack dab in the middle of a World War II novel. But they do that to you, these characters that kind of, you know, just suck you in. And I, I think we're attracted to audacious women, uh, whatever the time period. It's, it's people who, who just don't seem to have that gene that you and I have that's, you know, oh, should I? Should I? <laughs> should I really? Um, because you and I both have, I mean, we've both been married for, we have long, happy marriages. We have very stable home lives. So I think our fiction is a way for us to really kind of walk the tightrope, um, and kind of play with these characters who make very (laughs) different choices than we would. Um, I mean, I know in, in the case of Veronica that, um, you know, a lot of her certainty, one of the things that, that is really annoying about Veronica is she does not have a, a, just even so much as an ounce of self-doubt. Like she is so certain of who she is and her place in the world and what she's gonna do. And she absolutely gets that from Margaret Fountain, uh, who was very much that way in a, in a completely irritating and annoying uh, extent. Um, did you ever get annoyed by Nancy? <laughs> when you were doing her research? Did did she ever make a decision where you just wanted to reach through the pages and shake her and say, Nancy, why? Trying to think, there's, I have to roll back my mind. I'm right in the middle of writing another novel. So the streams are getting crossed in my head a little bit right now. (laughs) That happens. It's not so much something she did. In her biography, she would, Okay, so she's a woman, right? And she's a woman out there in the middle of nowhere with all these men. She's just surrounded by men all the time. So she is writing about that time. And then several of her biographers would also comment on how smart she was, how beautiful she was. A lot of comments about just how attractive and appealing she was to the male species in general. And A, I'm like, (laughs) of course you were. You were everything, you had it all. And in one of my initial drafts, just as I was kind of pulling everything together, her comments about that time and then the biographer's comments about her, finally my editor was like, okay, we get it. She's perfect. She's beautiful. (laughs) But is she human? And I, I realized, I realized that I ran the risk of creating this cartoon character like this. Yeah overly perfect person. And it's not that she didn't do all these things. She was beautiful and she was smart and she was very brave, but I had to drill down really hard and find the parts of her that were human. I had to find the moments where she would break as a person, where she would cry, where she would vomit, where she would come apart. And that- And she vomits really early on in the book. (laughs) She actually does three times. I didn't realize that she throws I mean, the up first one three is different like times. Really early on. <laughs> yes, it's in one of the first pages, which is uh. funny to me because <laughs> I would I would sooner die than throw up. It's like a thing with me, like anything else. Just give me anything else other than the stomach bug. <clears throat> but in that sense, it was it was annoying having to find her weaknesses because the way that she presented herself to the world was without weakness, but we all know that's not real. She was just very, very good at hiding it. Don't you think that that's something that particularly female characters, um, and I mean, she's not just a character, she's an actual woman, but even more so, it's incumbent upon women to hide that because those moments of humanity that could be overlooked or forgiven or you know chalked up to a momentary aberration if you're talking about a man for a woman will always be held up as, oh, you're not suitable for leadership. You're not, you don't have yeah. the right stuff. Yeah. yeah. And it was, she wasn't just a spy. She was a military leader and all of the spy stories of women 
in World War II are astonishing, but I couldn't find very many stories of female military leaders. So not only did she have to be able to do clandestine activities, she had to fight, she had to lead men, she had to be in charge and that's hard. I've got my computer pinging at me, I'm sorry. I don't know what that is. Um, yeah, and I think as authors, the other thing that we continually face is you've got this character, you want her to be real, you want her to be flawed, but we also have to make them likable, right? Because we have the uh, extra requirement, it seems, that our, that our female lead is likable. Yeah, and it's so and... frustrating sometimes because, you know, you, you, I wrestle with likable versus relatable, you know, whether you can understand yeah. this woman and why she does what she does, even if you don't necessarily want to be friends with her. Um, and there, there is always this double standard because um, I, I wrote a book a number of years ago in which the, um, the main characters have a love affair. And at one point now, she occasionally sleeps with her ex-husband who has remarried. But the male character is actively carrying on an affair with a married woman. The hate I got for the female character who is sleeping with her ex-husband mm -hmm. with his wife's permission, but the male character is committing double adultery and not a peep from people about what he was doing, even though to my mind, it was much worse, but everybody was holding her to a completely different standard of behavior. And I think, I think sometimes people not only do that, but they can get very uncomfortable with um, female rage. You know, they're a lot more comfortable with female tears than they are with female anger, uh, which I, I find very interesting. And, you know, I'm 52 now. I'm all about middle-aged lady rage. Like it's, it's, it's my thing now. <laughs> There's, there's this line in Codename Helena, and I remember writing it because I get a lot of comments on it. And at one point, Nancy says, <clears throat> um, this is a level of rage that requires two coats of lipstick and a fully loaded revolver. And I and thought, I, it's perfect. Yeah, I mean, that's, that's the kind of quote you wanna get a tattoo of. It's just, it's, <laughs> it's so good. It's yes. just so good. And I think every woman, especially because this has been such a challenging year, um, you know, and it, and the mm -hmm. burdens have disproportionately fallen on women who a lot of times are doing the homeschooling or having to, to juggle the, the work or even give up work entirely. I mean, we've, we've looked at the unemployment numbers. We know women are disproportionately uh, taking the, the, the lumps on this one. And I think women read lines like that. And, and I think that's the relatability factor is when, they say, oh, yeah. okay, yeah, you know, I'm not going to lead people into battle. I'm not going to be jumping out of airplanes, um, which she also does, but I, this is something I can, <laughs> I can relate to, you know, when you're fed up and you just, yes. you, sometimes all you can do is put that extra coat of lipstick on and get back in there because, you know, you don't have the luxury of a breakdown uh, because, you know, giving up sometimes right. is a, a privilege uh that a lot of people don't have because they've got to they've got to hold it together so right right um here's a question i was actually thinking about today when i was getting ready it made me laugh so deanna present day deanna yes ends up in victorian england with veronica <laughs> speedwell for an afternoon yeah what <laughs> do deanna and Victoria, Veronica, not Victoria, sorry. Veronica, what do you do with Veronica for your afternoon? You get one. I probably lock her outside and get busy with Stoker. I, I mean, <laughs> come on, come on. That was my next come question. On. I was like, okay, no. what do you do for an afternoon with Stoker? No, 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 no. Um, no, I'm, I'm uh, as I said, happily married. Stoker, Stoker will be safe from my predations, I promise. Um, you know, I feel like here's the problem. Um, I feel like we're both, Veronica and I are both too headstrong and too alpha. I, I feel like there would be some conflict there. Um, now, if we manage to be polite right. to each other and get along, I want to peek in the Belvedere. I want to go through that vivarium uh, yeah. where her butterflies are being bred because I actually, when I was writing the first book, 
I actually did um, raise butterflies uh, to see what it was like. Uh, really? You can buy these kits where they will send you the larva and they tell you yeah. how to set it all up and you, you can just nurture them from the time they're, they're in their little chrysalis. It's not a cocoon if it's a butterfly, it's a chrysalis. See, I had to learn natural history. Um, and then they, they come out of the, uh, the chrysalis with their beautiful little wings and you let them loose in the garden. And I did that, but I made the mistake of putting the habitat in the kitchen and butterflies, um, they smell like ass. They smell so bad. There is, um, when butterflies oh. excrete, it's called frass and it smells awful. And that was the smell in my kitchen. So my husband and I had a number of interesting conversations about that odor. Um, and you're not really supposed to move them once they've settled in. So uh, they were just oh, yeah. hanging out in the kitchen. Uh, and we ordered a lot of takeout uh, <laughs> while we were waiting for those little guys to, uh, to do their thing. Um, but yeah, so I was fascinated. Yeah, I make a point of funny. going to um, any place that has a butterfly habitat, I make a point of going. And the last one I got to visit was last January. So 13 months ago, when I was in uh, New Orleans, I went to the, um, the Audubon Center right there on Canal Street. There is a fantastic um, uh, entomology area and they've got a butterfly habitat in there. And I actually had the whole place to myself and it was magical. It's always super warm and damp in them. So your hair does just monstrous yes. things, but it's magic <laughs> because they're just fluttering around like jewels and they come and hang out on you. And so I would want to do that with Veronica. And I want a, a, a just a top to toe tour of the Belvedere. I want to see every piece of cool crap that they've collected from these, uh, you know, jewels that have come out of the Vatican, the suits of armor, the artwork, the mummies. I want to see all of it because I, I know there's some interesting stuff tucked away in there. I want to see all that. Oh, and then I would want to go to dinner at the Curiosity Club and meet all the other extraordinary oh, women that she knows. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And then well, after that, speaking of I'm going to the opera with Tiberius. <laughs> Choosing Tiberius. Okay. Mm -hmm. Speaking of butterfly habitats, just if you ever go to Chattanooga, go to the aquarium in Chattanooga and there's an incredible butterfly habitat on the top floor. Nice. So put I a pin in that one. That. I shall make it. Now, so what did you do to prepare to get into Nancy's head? Did you, did you uh, do any pistol shooting? Did you jump out of an airplane? I know you can rock the red lipstick, no. so I have no doubt that that happened. But did well, you, you did and you Nancy taught me about the lipstick. So I didn't. I, am, um, I didn't do any of that. I did what I typically do. I have this moment of total panic in which I've committed to a story and I've signed a contract to write it, and then I realize I know absolutely nothing about this time period or this moment in history, and I have a miniature come apart, and then I buy every every single book I can find on my subject. This time I was lucky. I only had, let's see, I've been four books that I had to read. When I was writing about the Romanovs, it was closer to 50 and that was hard. But I began reading and lucky for me, I began reading with um, Nancy's autobiography. It's called The White Mouse. It is long since out of print, but in it she details all of her war years and how she met her husband. <clears throat> and that was the single best tool that I had to learn her voice. This was Absolutely. the first novel I'd written entirely in first person. I'd written parts of one yeah. in first person, but this was the first time I'd taken the entire lump together. And reading her words about her own life helped me find, mainly it helped me find her sense of humor. That's the one thing I think people are often taken by surprise with this particular book is Nancy was funny. It's a yeah. hard book. It's got some teeth to it. It takes place yeah. during World War II. I mean, it's, yeah. there are some really brutal moments, mm -hmm. but she was so funny. You have these brutal moments interwoven with this really sweet love story with her husband. And then this sense of levity. And I think that was my favorite part writing it. She was the funniest character I've ever written. And I got to I feel like expand oh, on her Absolutely. sense of humor. Yeah. Yeah. And then I had to use my own sense of humor as well, which I hadn't really been able to do before now. So that was a blast. Yeah. It's always fun to write the characters who, who get up to some stuff. And, and even if they're using the, the humor as a coping mechanism, 
just to be able to to have those those little moments of levity in there to kind of you know brighten and lighten and and make it all a little bit less grim uh is is a really fun thing to be able to do as a writer and you're absolutely right getting to read um a memoir or diaries or even letters that somebody has written to get a sense of their voice and and to figure out you know what things do they think are funny you know where where are their values uh you know what what kinds of things would they think are absurd what kinds of things would they die for you can get a sense for all of that stuff when you get lucky enough to get some some first person material so good on you you mentioned the romanovs a second ago so for anybody who has not read do you have a copy of i was anastasia hanging around there because mine i don't have mine right on this shelf mine's in the other room um but if you have not read ariel's i was anastasia it is a freaking phenomenal book it was one of those books that i kind of staggered to the end of and then i think i texted you right when i was finished with it and i i think i called you a name uh even because it was just it was the yeah. most phenomenal piece of of writing um and actually i did not think you could top the romanov book uh but codename halan uh i think because it's funny it, you know it has those moments yes. and and that i i i think i was honest as it was a conjuring trick as a writer just i mean it was from a craft perspective as another professional i was looking at it going damn girl this is a master class <laughs> um codename helen is one of those books that i was like oh i'm, I'm just going to sit here and savor and enjoy the crap out of this um so so what are you working yeah. on now ariel what else do i get to enjoy <laughs> <laughs> Ooh, well, if you could see the wall that I'm looking at behind me, you would see a situation that I can only describe as sort of Russell Crowe circa a beautiful mind. It's like my, there are pictures and notes. There's, yes, I have red string connecting <laughs> ideas. To it. I'm close to being certifiable at this moment, but nice. these are the beginnings, not the beginnings, I'm about halfway through, but this is sort of the visual process for me as I pull this new novel together. At the moment, it's tentatively called The Frozen River. I don't know if that will be the final title, but it's about a woman named Martha Ballard and she was a midwife in the late 1700s in Maine. And I came across her story actually before I even wrote my debut novel, I've been holding on to this for 13 years. I would kind of come back to it every time <laughs> and I would go, uh, maybe I'm not ready. And then I do another one, but I am ready now. It feels like the right time for this particular story. And the reason I was drawn to Martha, just, <clears throat> I have a lifelong fascination with midwives. My, I'm one of six children. My mother delivered all of her babies by midwives. And because I'm the second oldest, I, got to go with her several times when she had my younger siblings. So I've got this absolute respect and fascination with the craft of midwifery. I mean, it's astonishing. And the thing about Martha that really caught my attention is that over the 30 years that she practiced, she delivered over a thousand babies and she never lost a mother in childbirth, not once. That's amazing. And doctors today can't post statistics like that. No. The other thing about her though, and again, this goes back to my fascination with um, source material, is that Martha kept a diary for those 30 years. At a time when many women couldn't read or write, she kept a diary for 30 years. It was more of a day book. It's, she didn't do a whole lot of editorializing, but there was information. And in that diary, she recorded every birth and every death and every murder and every scandal that happened in her small community during that time. <clears throat> And in its pages is the only written record of a rape trial that changed the legal system in our country. And so I have a copy of this diary and this coming novel is um, my attempt to tell her story. What about Fabulous. you? Well, um, this is, is my own little, you can see the, the Victorian picture. This is the master board for Veronica. And then this side yeah. is each individual Veronica book. Things get changed up. So you can't see what's on it because, you know, secret. Um, but this is, this over here is Veronica seven. 
Um, and then I am in the middle of writing. Um, that's very early days yet. I am in the middle of writing um, <laughs> my first contemporary, which is about uh, four female assassins on the cusp of retirement who have to band together to take out the man who wants them dead. And there's a nice chunk set in New Orleans. So I, uh, I got to put all of my, Ooh, nice. my travels to, to good use, but uh, <laughs> Yeah, so that's, uh, that's, I'm getting ready. I've taken a wee break and I'm getting ready to get back in the trenches of writing. Um, so yeah, fun stuff, all fun stuff. It is fun. Yeah. So uh, what do you think? We take some questions? You wanna do that? Yeah, absolutely. If there are any. I would love that. Are we gonna do, um, okay. how do we wanna do this? Are we gonna let people type them in or are we gonna unmute? I see. <laughs> okay, so I see some in the chat box here. So Janine asks, when will the assassin book be out roughly? Um, I think the tentative release for the assassin book is going to be, God, what year is it? 21? Um, I think the tentative <laughs> release is going to be summer of 22. Um, so that's, Ooh, that's, hey, I, our that's next week will be out at the same time. Yes, our, our dastardly plan to, to tour together may actually happen. Um, yeah, so that, and that's always subject to change um, because it's, it's right now they've penciled it in, they've held it in the queue. Uh, so it will, uh, we'll see. But as soon as I have a firm title, because my title was absolutely rejected, um, which happens sometimes. Um, but as soon as we have a working title and we have a release date, all of that stuff will go across my social media and out through my newsletter. Because I, um, I for those of you who don't know, I love, I freaking love Twitter. Uh, I, I tweet um, most days. Um, I've given up most other forms of social media, but Twitter is my jam. So you can always find me over there. Um, and that's where a lot of things get announced. Uh, so yeah. So what about you? What, 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 what things are coming out next? When? Well, the next, uh, well, we've got the paperback now, obviously. And then it's my midwife book. So I guess next year feels soon to say that, but about a year and a half, I suppose, will be my Martha Ballard book. And I'm working on several other things as I do all the time. Lots of irons in the fire, but that's the next one. I Let's see, Garden District actually asked, Ladies, are you finding it easier or harder to write during our COVID situation? I am finding it so much harder. I always say that I love having written and I love the revision and editing process. I love taking the thing and making it better. I always have a harder time taking nothing and turning it into something. So to be in drafting mode during a global pandemic with two of my children home full-time homeschooled has been challenging, but I've had to kind of pull a few things out of my toolbox when all the boys were young. We had all four of our boys in five years. So it's been bedlam for a long time. And when they were really little and nobody was in school, I would write during nap time or nights and weekends. And I've kind of had to shift my creative times back to those moments because I mean, they need me present and accounted for more than ever with massive uncertainty in the world. So I've had to look toward the margins of my day more than I have before, but it's a season. This too shall pass. The kids got older. They went to school. I got my time back. It'll happen again. What about you, Deanna? Well, um, in a weird way, I'm finding it a lot easier uh, just because when I can focus, it's the focus that I find is really, really hard uh, getting in the right headspace. But when I'm in the study, when the door is closed, um, and I, I have just the one child and she's 26 and works in DC as a recruiter for a law firm. So I, I, have, I have my time, um, but I, yeah. I'm finding that it is such a phenomenal escape when I am in those worlds mm -hmm. and I don't have to think about anything. I don't have to go, oh God, I forgot to put, you know, half of what I need on the Instacart order. I've got to go put in, an, I mean, I don't have to think about anything like that. I can just focus on 
the world that I've created and I can enjoy those characters in that time. And then I can come out and think about, you know, the, mm -hmm. the stuff that I actually have to worry about out there. In here, it's, it's just like this quiet, awesome little cocoon and it's fantastic. Um, but yeah, getting, getting in the right headspace to write at all is a very tricky thing right now, especially as, as things have kind of ground on and, you know, it's month after month after month, I've, I'm finding the reserves are running a little thin, uh, at this mm -hmm. point, but, uh, yeah, but hanging in there and, you know, uh, and I, in some ways, I think I've done some of my best work this year. So that will, um, you know, yeah. Yeah, it hasn't, it, it could have been a lot worse. It could have been a lot worse. So, yeah. Yeah. Um, we have more. See. Katie questions. asks, uh, yeah, recommendations from authors are always great. Anything you recommend to read, watch, listen to? And then, oh, hold on. Deanna is how I found Widow of Rose House, and she done it. And I'm so grateful. <clears throat> so, what yeah, are you watching? Widow, Widow of Rose House um, is great. <clears throat> she done it is actually a podcast. Um, usually about golden age hmm. uh, mystery. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, Ariel, back up to Shanna uh, Zucker's question because she had a couple of questions okay. for you. <clears throat> Third from the top. Oh, okay. Let's see. <coughs> she said, Shanna Zucker said, I had the delightful experience of listening to Codename Helene as an audiobook. Ariel, can you speak to your experience hearing your book voiced by a narrator, specifically one who won, <coughs> won? <clears throat> Sorry, I have allergies. I... You and me both. I'm, they're hitting at the same time. Specifically one who wasn't you and had an accent that matched <clears throat> Nancy Wake. It's kind of fantastic. I loved it. Barry Krynick did the audio and she was amazing. And then, oh, oh, forgive me. I have forgotten the name of the actor that voiced her husband. He has these small interstitials throughout. <clears throat> And it's funny because the director asked me if I had any recommendations. <clears throat> I asked for a woman with an Australian accent and I kind of jokingly said, oh, and give me a male narrator with a really sexy voice. And we went back and forth between um, having a full French accent or just French in the, on the dialogue. And we settled on French on the dialogue. And then I heard him and I went, oh my gosh, like, whew, they delivered, that's amazing. And it was really fun to listen to. I enjoyed it. And my funny story about that, my husband, and the, my husband's a contractor. So he's a residential contractor, does mainly kitchens and bathrooms, that kind of thing. And he and the guy he works with were listening to the book on audio. And there's a scene where we get to Nancy's wedding and then they go off and they have their wedding night and it's all very sweet. But her husband, narrates that particular scene and my husband came home from work that day he's like oh, we got to the wedding and we were in this lady's <laughs> kitchen listening to your book real loud and both of us were red as tomatoes <laughs> so I made well I didn't make the audiobook made uh two grown men blush quite rightly in a stranger's kitchen so love it that is glorious um Okay, when will Veronica Seven show up if you're busy assassinating right now? I am so busy assassinating right now. Mm. Um, Veronica, my Veronica books usually come out in March. Um, like I said, An Unexpected Peril will be out mm. March 2nd in hardcover. Um, book seven may get pushed a couple of months out of March of next year, uh, depending on how quick we're able to get things done with the Assassin's book, because this is the first time that I'm doing uh, two books that I'm balancing at the same time with um, Penguin. Um, Ariel, what does your support system mm -hmm. look like while you're deep into writing a novel during a pandemic? Larissa wants to know. That's a great question. I am really, really fortunate for two things that I have a great husband who has always been exceptionally supportive of my work. And he was supportive of my work long before I was doing it professionally long before I ever made a penny writing, he was supportive. So that has been, it's game changing really from the time my children were little, I could always count on him to take them far away so that I could go work. <laughs> um, the other thing I'm, he just stuck his head in the office door there. Uh, the other thing I'm really grateful for is that my children are older now. 
there was a time where my full-time job was making sure nobody died. Like that's all I did, I think for a decade straight, but they're all older now. My youngest is 12 and they're very independent. I have a driver. I've got like, they can run and they can go ride their bikes around the neighborhood and they can make all of their own meals and do all of their own laundry and clean their own bathroom. So it's changed. It has really changed the way that I work and it's, I, I'm still here. I have to focus on them, but I don't have to hover over them anymore. It makes but a huge the question difference that has made, when they get yeah, to a certain age. It's also it made really my does. need for a support system less. Yeah, it absolutely so, like, does. Because I noticed a big difference long about the time my daughter got into middle school. It was like, oh, oh. Um, and I, I mean, in my case, I, I'm totally going to swipe your answer because I wrote for 14 years before I got published and did not bring in a penny during that time. And every year, because I have a teaching certificate, every year the school year would roll around and I would say to my husband, oh, I should go get a job. <clears throat> and every year he would say, you have a job, you're a writer, you just don't get paid for it yet. And so oh. I, you know, it would be another 12 months then that I would be beavering away trying to get uh, published. Mm -hmm. So having that support is, I mean, it's, you know, Ariel, it's, it's key. It really is because you don't have to fight for that time for yourself. You can, you can walk around and book, like they know what book brain looks like and they know not to talk to you when you've got oh, that kind yeah. of distant look, like, you know, you're hearing people's voices. They know, oh, okay, she's processing and they, they, they leave you be. Yes. Um, and it, it can be stuff like, you know, I didn't have to do the laundry that day. I'm not the person who had to arrange the groceries. I'm not, because my husband opened his own business last year and works from home. So we're both in the home and, you know, I mean, if I'm hard up against it, then he takes over literally everything. Um, and if he's on a deadline, right. then I'm the one who, did, you know, so we just tag team each other, depending on whose deadlines are more pressing and who's about to absolutely yeah. lose their mind. And we're there for each other. Plus my parents live, uh, downstairs yeah. actually. Uh, mm. so that's helpful. Very helpful. Oh, wow. <laughs> Yeah. yeah, I'm a, I'm I definitely, a I'm aware. I'm aware how fortunate I am. I know that if my, my kids were younger, if I was a single mom, if I was working full time, particularly as um, a healthcare provider or a teacher, I would be in the middle of a massive come apart. I would be oh, not sure. okay right now. For sure. And absolutely, I am so aware that it's, I'm, I'm so fortunate. It's not a thing I take for granted right now. No, not at all. It's an absolute privilege to be able to do what we do. And it's been, it's been really lovely too, because like the times that I, I, I have felt really guilty about promoting saying, oh, you know, I know things are weird right now, but I got to tell you, I've got a book coming out. What I'm hearing from readers is no, we need this. We need escapes. Tell mm -hmm. us when your books are coming out because this is helping. Um, and I know as a reader, it's been hugely like that's been my sanity a lot of times is being able to dissolve myself and go into someone else's world and kind of get that yeah. escape. Um, and it's I art is what gets us through uh, the challenging times. Uh, yeah. In many forms of art, I'm not typically a big TV watcher. I grew up without a television at all. So I, it's not my typical first go to. Right. But I've watched more good television and more good films during this pandemic than oh ever my God, before. Have you seen so the Queen's much Gambit? good stuff. Yeah. There's so much yeah. good stuff out there yeah. right now. Um, we have a great question from Melanie about in a non-pandemic a non world, how much of your mm -hmm. process involves media sources and inspirations like books and how much needs to be in the real world with butterflies, mm -hmm. visiting cities, things like that. Um, for me in a perfect world, I would get to travel for each book. Um, I, I like to go back to London right. every couple of years, um, and just kind of freshen up. Um, I, in order to do the, um, uh, the assassins book, uh, I, I made a couple of trips in relationship to that, even if it's a different time period, um, because most of what I write is Victoriana, you can still very much get a sense of place when you're able to travel. Mm -hmm. Um, and you can, you can just absorb the vibe of a place um, what it's like when people are speaking a foreign language, you know, it, it's, you're in Paris, it sounds like music, uh, you know, what is, what is the air smell like? What's the quality of the light? 
Um, those are things that, that don't often change. Um, and they can really give you a right. lot of, not only the tactile details um, that will help bring a book to life, they can also in a very practical way, many times you can find tiny museums or independent bookstores where you can find research materials that you can't find anyplace else. So that's hugely helpful right. as well. What about you, Beth? <clears throat> I, in a perfect world, I would have taken a research trip for each of my novels. Uh, my first novel was set in New York City. I had didn't go to New York until after I wrote the novel. My second book was set on board the Hindenburg, so there was really no way to research that one. <laughs> you um, could go to a field in New Jersey. Yeah. And then, of course, my third was set in a number of places, but primarily right in the middle of the Russian Revolution. This novel is set in England and France and Scotland, and I've never been able to take a research trip. Cue the four boys. Uh, cue the very, very, very busy family life. As a matter of fact, when I wrote, uh, the year that I wrote Codename Helene, I, all four of my boys were in four different schools across two school districts. So the first 45 minutes of my day was sorting through emails from various schools about whatever I had to deal with. And all four of them were playing baseball. So it was, I mean, that's been my life. It's been my life for a very long time and I'm really grateful for it, but I have had to turn to books. I've had to turn to very mm -hmm. specific research material and I've had to recreate a world from my research material. With my first novel, you mentioned what does the air smell like? With my first novel, it was set in 1930 New York City. And I found <clears throat> in this random corner of the internet, a noise pollution report published in 1930, in which people were complaining about all the different noises that were going on. And I was able to kind of build, and the Empire State Building was being built and there were milk trucks and all the different things. And I've had to get really creative Google Street View helps. There are many, many things that can help. But one day the children will leave and then my husband and I can go roam around the world and visit fun cities. Yeah, you can. Yeah, it's amazing how many great re resources are out there. Um, mm -hmm. the, I mean, YouTube videos and, uh, you know, firsthand accounts of people who've traveled there. And I'm one of my favorite cheats is if I have to research a setting, um, finding people who grew up there and have written memoirs, because if you're a child in a place, you remember it very differently than an adult yeah. would. And I have found so many more extremely specific details from reading um, like uh, Rumor Godden or MMK's memoirs of places where they were when they were kids um, and you know, swiping details from them uh, because that's what we do thieves yeah. or elegant yeah. thieves <laughs> <laughs> i like that so thank you again britain thank you garden district thank you deanna thank yeah, you everybody for Oaks. coming um uh, it's been a delightful evening listening to you too thank you and oh, Deanna's. <laughs> garden district has our books i I'm happy to send book plates to you, Britain, or to anybody we, that wants them. I wish plates. I could get. Okay, good, 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 good. Yes. Um, so we yeah, put in links in the chat. We have links in the chat board for anyone who has not gotten your books yet, or if there's. We are already taking pre-orders on Deanna's new book, which comes out in what two, three weeks. Yeah, something so, like that. Uh, <laughs> we'd love to see love to see some orders come in for Deanna's new book. Awesome. But ladies, thanks Yay. very much. It was a really delightful evening. Thank you all so much. This has been so much fun. It's always a treat to hang out with Ariel and, and getting to see all these, these bright faces is lovely. Yeah, it's fun. And we will come back. We'll come back together. We'll make it work somehow. Absolutely. It's a, thank you so much. Thank you everybody for being here and for reading and asking great questions. This yes, was wonderful questions. This was a treat. Thank you. All right. so. Have All a right. good evening. You too.